So we have to find the rate law for the following reaction, right? We have this big molecule that we have in molecular formula reacting with a hydroxide, right? And, and then it's going to give us um, this other molecule, and then it's going to give us a bromide. So when it says find the rate law, it's really just saying the rate is equal to k and you have something in that bracket that bracket and then depending on the type of reaction you could have two brackets and so really you're trying to figure out um, essentially what was in the reaction automatically we can eliminate answer choice C D and E why can we eliminate them well notice that you have a square on all of them and usually you're not working with squares that's saying that you have something over here and it's like it's a bit weird but if I remember correctly it's around like this so that 2 in front of the OH would be a square when it translates to the um, to the equation method but notice that we're not really working with squares so we're just gonna ignore these therefore answer choice E D and C are incorrect because well you're squaring something that's not necessarily correct right and over here um, this fails to hold on let's ignore this right so it's either A or B and the answer choice would be B but why well it's B because an in, in SN2 reaction, which is what you have. Um, so notice that, well, let me let me give the rundown for this one. Since this is negative right here, since this is, let's, you could say this is like NaOH, right? We just ignore the Na because it's a spectator ion. So when you write down the, the formula, you're just gonna ignore the Na. You're gonna have OH negative. Well, whenever you have a, an anion, most likely is gonna be an SN2 or an E2 reaction, right? And so, because we're working with a an an on, sorry an anion, you're going to be having SN2 or E2. In both cases, the two right here shows that your your rate is going to have two reactants, right? And so, two reactants goes with SN2, or two reactants goes with E2. Now it's not A because this would correspond, this would correspond to an SN1 or an E1. Why? Well, SN1 or E1 is 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 primarily when you're dealing with a neutral or a very or, or a very 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 weak nucleophile like NaH, right? That would be an SN1 or E1. Since we're working with hydroxide, which is a very strong base. It's either going to be SN2 or E2. In both cases, you're going to have a, two brackets. So you would have your carbon chain, which is a bromine, and you would have a, a hydroxide, right? So that's SN2 or E2. This is a second order. Okay. So all I had to do was notice that we're working with a negative uh, nucleophile, very strong nucleophile. That means that we're SN2, E2. That means that we're going to have two brackets. Not squares, but we're just going to have two brackets. Okay, so consider the following reaction of, of butyl bromide with the OH, and notice that it's the same reactant. I just gave you the reason why it's SN2, right? Now, assuming no other changes, what effect would be the result from simultaneously doubling the concentration of bromide and OH? So it's saying the rate would equal something if you did this, 2 times 2, right? So notice that I said 2 times 2. So 2 times 2, well, that's 4. So the answer would be D, 4. OK, so here's something to think about. If you're saying that if we decreased bromine by a half, and then we increased hydroxide by 2, well, what, what would be the reaction rate? Well, 2 times a half is just 1, right? So it would stay the same. And what I'm trying to show you is that whenever you have an SN2 or E2 reaction, it's going to be dependent on both, um, both substrates or nucleophiles. 
So, for instance, if I increased one, th one thing by two and increased the other thing by two, or by four, so we increased one by two and the other by four, four times two is eight, and so the rate would increase by eight. I'm just showing you that whenever you have this type of problem, you could just multiply them, right? You don't square them, you just multiply them. So four times two is eight. For an SN1 reaction, if I said I'm increasing bromide by a factor of 10, well, your rate should be increasing by a factor of 10, right? Because that is unimolecular. In this case, we're dealing with a bimolecular or dimolecular. And so it really depends on both bromide and hydroxide. Because we increased bromide and hydroxide by two, we're just saying two times two, and two times two is four. And so the rate would increase by four times. So now we have to find the potential energy for the extragonic reaction. All right, well, what's an extragonic reaction? An extragonic reaction is a reaction that is favored by nature. And what do you know about nature? Does nature like creating athletic babies? So if an Olympian had a baby, would you expect that baby to be very muscular? Or would you expect that baby to be very fat and chubby? Well, I would expect the baby to be very fat and chubby. Why? Why does nature prefer having a weak product? Wouldn't you think that nature would prefer having a strong product? Well, no, because it has to do with entropy, which is like this, the uh, disorder of the universe, but I'm not going to get into a Gen Chem 2 idea when we're talking about organic chemistry. And so all I have to tell you is that for an extragonic reaction, you're going to typically have a starting value. This is the energy that you start with, right? And then we go over here, something could happen. It doesn't matter what happens, we could spike really sharply or whatever. But as long as we end up lower, as long as we end up lower than, than what we started with, so let's say that this is 25 and that this is like 5 right here, if we end up lower than what we started with, it's going to be extragonic. So we started off strong, but then our product was weak. And that's what is favored in nature. And because our product over here is weak, this is going to be an extragonic reaction. Now, notice that for question or for answer choice one, you started off weak and then you got strong, which is kind of not extragonic. That's not good. You actually absorbed some energy. And so I would say that that is endothermic, right? Uh, if you like to think of a different way, exo means to exit. And so energy is exiting your system. And well, if you're losing energy, you should have a lower, you should have a decrease. This is endo because energy enters your system, right? And so since energy entered the system, it's going to be endothermic and it's not going to be as favored. It's not spontaneous, meaning it's not naturally favored. And so that was an increase of energy that is not correct. Same thing here. You went from a low to high. That's not good. Um, for here, you didn't have a... A, um, a, an increase or a decrease, you stayed the same. You had 50, you, you started with 50, you ended up with 50. And so that's not good either. If we were asked to find uh, endothermic, well, um, one, two, and four, they look pretty good. But um, we're not, we're asked to find exothermic or extragonic. Now notice that we started at some value, let's say it's 50, and then we did our experiment. Turns out that our product was a lower energy. Let's say that it's very close to two. Well, that's very good. Uh, you want to lose energy. You want energy to exit your system. And so this would be exo ex exergonic, right? So you start from some value, you need to end up lower than the starting value. So this one has a lower peak compared to this guy. And so that would be answer choice E. Now we have to find out the product for this SN2 reaction. Okay, since it's an SN2 reaction, I know that if there's a chiral center, I will have to do an inversion in the chiral center. Right, but if it's an SN1 reaction, I'm gonna have a racemic mixture. And racemic mixture, if you recall, is just when you have both R configuration and S configuration, right? And, well, we're dealing with an SN2. And so I'm not going to have a racemic mixture. 
So since I'm not going to have a racemic mixture, I'm not going to have answer choice C because this is racemic. That's racemic. And that goes for SN1. And we're dealing with SN2, so that is incorrect. C is incorrect. Okay. So yeah, for sure that is an SN2 reaction. Why? Well, you have a sodium, which is a metal. And a metal, metal typically takes away some some positivity from the oxygen or whatever it's attached to and it's gonna make whatever it's attached to negative and so this is a very strong negative right it's a very strong anion and so it's gonna be an SN2 reaction so what happens in an SN2 reaction well an SN2 reaction is very fast it's it's a one-step process and well I'm gonna be reacting with this bromine and this hydrogen okay so if I'm reacting with this bromine and hydrogen, this and my product should stay the same. I should still have a hydrogen at the top and a methyl group at the bottom, right? So this stays the same, that stays the same. This is different. Uh, notice that hydrogen flipped over and then bromine stayed the same. So we, we didn't even react with bromine. So that's a fail. And then hydrogen uh, was reversed. So that's also a fail. So number three is incorrect. Okay, right. Um, so for sure, this molecule is chiral. It's chiral, right? And if it's chiral, then you're going to have to do an inversion for the chemistry. So what happens is, it all happens in one step, right? This bromine breaks off, and we form our carb carbocation. And this negative oxygen sees a positive carbon, and he's very attractive to it. So he goes and merges with him, with this carbon. And then sodium, or, or it could be the solvent. Typically it's the solvent, but I'll just say it's a sodium in this case. Sodium picks up this negative bromine and they're happy. Right, but since I did that reaction, I'm gonna have to invert my hydrogen because the, the, the whole molecule as a whole was chiral. And since I invert the hydrogen, I'm expecting a hydrogen on the bottom, okay? And so this answer has hydrogen on the bottom, and then our methyl group, or not our methyl group, but our uh, methyl oxide group on the top, which is correct. So answer choice B would be correct. Uh, the reason why one is incorrect is because you did the reaction, but you didn't invert your stereochemistry. You didn't do that. So um, that's not good. If you wanted to, to see this right here, so whatever is going upwards is going to be a wedge. So hydrogen is going upwards, that's a wedge. This is going downwards, that's going to be in my methyl group. And over here, we have a hydrogen going upwards. Bromine's going downwards. Whenever we do our reaction, we're going to have to flip our stereochemistry. So now OCH3 goes here, and whatever was a wedge becomes a hash or dash. And so since what, uh, since hydrogen was a wedge, it's going to be a dash. And so that translates to uh, structure 2, right? So just remember, if you're chiral and you're doing an SN2 reaction, you have to invert the chemistry, the stereochemistry. And you're only going to have what? If you have an R, you're going to have an S. If you started with an S, you're going to have an R. And if you want me to to um, do the configuration, I'll do it over here. So let's see. This would be number one. Let's see over there. Mm -hmm. So I would say that this is a. Uh, it's a bit different, really different actually. So you start here, there. Well, I would do over here. So I would do one two and then three and four so one two three that's an r but now you have to reverse it or no sorry so that's an s but you're gonna have to reverse it so that's r okay and over here you have one so this carbon compared to that carbon they're the same but then this carbon compared to that carbon they're different and so i'd rather have this carbon so i'm going to say that this is two this is going to be three and four so you have this, one, two, three. Hydrogen is in the back, 
So we keep it as normal. So that's going to be an S configuration. That's an S configuration. And so I told you that since this carbon was R, this molecule was R, whenever you have an S and two reaction, you're just going to have the reverse of R, which turns out to be S. Whenever you have an S and one reaction, you could have R again, or you can have S. And so that's a racemic mixture. Since we're dealing with S and two, we're not going to have a racemic mixture. So it's not C, it's going to be B, right? Okay. Now we have the major product of this following reaction would be what? Would be what? Well, again, we're dealing with S and two. And so I'm not going to have an equal mixture of one or two, right? So that doesn't make sense because answer choice E is talking about a racemic mixture, which is very possible with S and one, but with S and two racemic mixtures are not possible. Okay. So answer choice E is incorrect. That's bad. Okay. And let's see over here, we have a hydroxide and let's make sure that this methyl group it stays the same. Okay. What am I going to be reacting with? Am I going to react with the hydrogen, the, this guy, the methyl group, what? Well, I'm going to be reacting with the chlorine. Actually, I'm going to be reacting with the chlorine, right? And so if I, if I don't see anything that reacted with my chlorine, so what I'm trying to say is if I see an answer choice that still has my chlorine attached to this carbon, I know it's wrong because after my reaction, my chlorine should be popped off and hydro hydroxide should be in its place. All right, so answer choice three still has the chlorine and same thing with four. And so I could say that three and four are incorrect because they still have the chlorine. So now it's either one or two. And you know what? I'd rather have, I'd rather have answer choice two. Why? Okay, well, you're probably wondering, hey, you know, we should be doing an inversion of stereochemistry because uh, our car, our molecule was mole uh, was chiral, and you know, I totally agree. But notice that this chlorine is not attached to this center carbon. If that chlorine were attached to that center carbon, then yes, we would have to do a stereochemistry inversion. However, this chlorine is attached to this carbon and that carbon has two hydrogens. So is that carbon a chiral or is it chiral? No, that carbon is a chiral. And so the immediate carbon that chlorine is attached to is a chiral. Do we have to do an inversion at an a chiral molecule or carbon? No, you don't have to do an inversion at an a chiral carbon. And because we don't have to do an inversion, we would keep everything the same. So hydrogen on the left, um, methyl oxide on the right, and this guy, right? On the top. So it would be B. Uh, number one says an inversion, but that only works if the chlor that would only work if the chlorine were attached to the center carbon. However, this, cl this chlorine is attached to a neighbor carbon and that neighbor carbon itself is a chiral, right? So we can't do anything. We can't rotate. We could just do a substitution with no rotation. So that's very tricky. Be, be on the lookout for that on the exam, right? Right. So now we have the substitution reaction that takes place, right? When R3 bromo three methylhexane is treated with sodium methoxide, which of the following would be true, all right? So first of all, it wouldn't be a substitution reaction. I think that's a typo on the practice practice exam. Why? Well, listen, we're dealing with a sodium methoxide and sodium methoxide is as follows. Or rather just the O, right? And so is just sodium methoxide. Well, if it's sodium, you know that sodium is going to be a metal and it's going to pull some positivity from that oxygen or from the methyl group, whichever I believe it's oxygen. Since this oxygen is technically more negative, you're going to be dealing with a very strong base, a very strong anion. Okay. Well, if we're dealing with something that has a charge, a negative charge, most likely it's going to be SN2 or E2. Now SN1 is automatically incorrect because for SN1, you're going to have to either be a very, very weak 
weak uh, nucleophile or a neutral nucleophile, right? So this is a very strong nucleophile because oxygen has a very big um, electronegativity number, right? And so B, C, and D are incorrect. So it's either SN2 or E2. So which one is it? Well, the thing is, this is a very big base, okay? It's a bulky base. And you should know that eliminations, well, they favor uh, big, bulky bases. So anything like, like um, T-butyl oxide or T-butanol, right? That would be a very big bulky base, and most likely it's going to be E2. Typically, it's E2. Now, you have an oxygen with like this guy. You have OCH3. Now, it may not seem a lot, but it's pretty bulky. You have like four things in that molecule. You have, you have five things actually. You have an oxygen, one carbon, and three hydrogens. And so that's five things compared to just sodium hydroxide, which has like three things, right? So, because it's a big bulky base, right, the three Bs, it's going to be an E2 reaction. That's going to be E, right there. But how does an E1 or E2 reaction occur? Well, let's try out this molecule. Let's do R3-bromo-3-methylhexane, right? So we have a hexane, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and we want an R configuration. Okay, so that means I have a bromo right here, and then we have a methyl group right there. So if we were to do a configuration, we would have, or prioritization, I should say, we have one, two, three, and four. The reason why I put my two on the right side is because if I compare this guy and that guy, well, they're the same. But if I go down the line again, I have a CH3 versus a CH2. I'd rather have a CH2 than a CH3, so that's gonna be number two. Right, so the right side is going to be number two, and um, you know it's not this. It's actually one, two, three, and four. My apologies, right? So right here, that's going to be an S configuration. You have one, two, three, but my lowest group, which turns out to be a methyl group, is on the wedge, and I want my lowest group to be on the dash, and so I'm just going to have to reverse it. So that's going to be an R configuration, okay? And sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes it's the first, um, the first picture that you draw. And you know, if you had a bromine on the wedge at first, well, you're going to get an S configuration, which isn't good, right? So you just have to reverse that picture. So it's a 50/50 chance that you get it on the first try, right? So now we're we're going to have to do a a um, a E2 reaction, elimination. So what's an E2 elimination? Well, whenever you do an E2 elimination, you're actually working with the alpha carbon and a beta carbon and also the beta hydrogens. So you're probably wondering what's an alpha and what's a beta. Well, alpha, that's just a parent carbon. It's a carbon that has a reaction going on. So this carbon right here has a bromine and that bromine is participating in the elimination, right? And since that carbon has the bromine, it's going to be acting as a parent carbon. And so we're going to say that this carbon is going to be an alpha carbon, right? Now, anything after the alpha carbon, whether it's going from the left or from the right, is going to be called a beta. So these two, I should probably do that in a different color, these two are going to be called uh, beta carbons. And this one over here, They're going to be called gamma carbons, okay? So these are just like carbon A, carbon B, carbon C, okay? So there's nothing special. It's just a placement of the carbons. And really, you don't have to know about gamma carbons yet. Just know about beta carbons and beta alpha, uh, or alpha carbons as well, okay? So these beta carbons, they have implied hydrogens, right? If you remember. And these hydrogens... Well, they're called beta hydrogens, okay? And what happens in an E2 reaction, and by the way, E2 happens in one step, same thing like SN2, okay? 
what happens is that this bromine pops off and we form a carbocation. And well, this hydrogen doesn't like that carbocation. So instead, it doesn't matter if it's a wedge or a hash, but one of these hydrogens from the left or from the right, well, they're going to do what? They're going to pop off too. So this electron is going to go over here and make a double bond, right? It's going to make a double bond. It doesn't matter if I picked the left hydrogen from the wedge or from the hash, or if I went to the right carbon and picked the wedge or hash hydrogen and it went over here, it wouldn't matter, right? It wouldn't matter. Of course, this hydrogen can also go over here, but that's not going to be stable. Why is it not stable? Well, whenever you have a reaction, you always want to have your beta hydrogen cleave off and go toward the bromine or toward the alpha carbon. Now, if I did my hydrogen cleaving off and going over here, then we're moving away from the alpha carbon. And that doesn't make any sense. That's not stable. Whenever you do an E2 reaction or E1, whenever um, you're just going to place your hydrogen, your beta hydrogen, closer to the halide or closer to the alpha carbon. And in this case, if I were to do my E2 reaction, for sure I would have either this guy, this guy, that guy, or that guy, it doesn't matter. One of them, just one, has to cleave off and go towards the bromine or the alpha carbon. That way, or it could be that way, okay? So after that, you have a lone hydrogen, and usually that bromine picks up this hydrogen. So now you have a bromine that's negative, and it's going to pick up some hydrogen, okay? And that's going to be an, an elimination reaction. And you shouldn't have, like, this uh, methyl oxide shouldn't connect. It should not connect to this molecule, okay? Because that wouldn't be an elimination reaction. Elimination, you just eliminate the halide. You don't add anything. You just put in a double bond, okay? So you're just relocating those electron pairs, right? Now we're dealing with another practice, practice problem that deals with um, mechanisms, right? So we have an aerial. It looks like we're not messing with that aerial, so we're going to ignore it. And then notice that we had an, an inversion of stereochemistry. So for sure, it's not going to be E2 or E1, because for an E1 or E2 reaction, you're going to have a double bond placement. Do you see any double bonds over here? Did we add any double bonds? No, we didn't add any double bonds, and so it's not C or D. So it's either SN1 or SN2. Well, now we have to look at our nucleophile. So, by the way, this is going to be a substrate. Substrate. And, you know, I just butchered that word as usual. Substrate. And this is going to be our nucleophile. Okay. Right, and notice something. Is that nucleophile neutral? No, it's not neutral. It actually has a negative charge, and nitrogen is pretty electronegative. It's not not that electronegative, but it's it's okay, right? It's not like hydrogen where it has no electronegativity almost. It does have some electronegativity, and so you can consider it as a very strong reactive reactant, right? And since it's it's going to be acting as a nucleophile, it has to have a negative charge. Since this nitrogen has a negative charge, typically it's going to be an SN2 reaction. If we were dealing with water, for instance, if instead of N3, we're going to have water, then you would do an SN1 reaction. But since we have something that is negative, that actually has a, a negative charge, you're going to be dealing with an SN2 reaction. And so what happened was, this bromine popped off, this happens in one step, we form a carbocation, which is flat, and so this nitrogen comes in from the back, and this hydrogen goes in the front, so over here you should have a hydrogen in the front wedge, and the nitrogen group should go in the back, right, and then we're going to have some lone, lone bromine, usually paired up with sodium or some metal. So which one is primarily unreactive in an SN2 reaction? Well, if it's unreactive and you're not giving me any nucleophiles, well, this one is a primary carbon. 
I know that for secondary carbon it gets a little slow and then tertiary carbons it's really unfavorable, it's not good. So this one is also primary and if you do it really quickly you figure out that everything is primary, right? So what do we do? Well the answer is E, but why is that? Well A, it, it has a very skinny molecule, there's not a lot of groups that can catch you, right? And so chlorine can pop off easily because, as you know, SN2 is very sensitive to steric strain, or as if you want in simple words, SN2 really cares if there are big groups around it. Because if there are big groups around it, well, it could grab the nucleophile or it could block the nucleophile. For instance, over here, we have a lot of hydrogens. And these hydrogens can repel things. And so if I had um, some hydroxide, if it gets too close to this hydrogen, it's going to repel because you have an electron mixing with some other electrons and they're not going to be able to come together. So in this case, it's you're going to experience some steric strain, but it's not as bad. It's not as bad. So first of all, this is going to be number one. That's pretty good. This one is not good, but it's not bad. Over here, it's the same thing except your hydrogens are going to be a little further away from you and so you're not going to have that much strain because the big guys are far away from you and so they can't hurt you as much. So that's going to be number two. This has to be number three. Now you have a lot of big guys and so that's very unfavorable. It's going to be worse than B, but they're far away from you. And so it's not that bad, but again, it's not good, right? And so that's going to be number four because of steric strain. These hydrogens could block you. Whenever you try to do a reaction, they could repel you. Now, answer choice E is going to be the worst one because you have a lot of big groups, hydrogens and carbons, that can repel you. And so these big guys are very close to you. These, these guys are very close to you. They're right next to the alpha carbon. So to be more technical, this beta carbon has a lot of, a lot of uh, steric strain or steric groups right there. And a hydroxide is going to be very intimidated if he tries to go over there, he's going to be blocked. And so the more groups you have, and the bigger the groups, and the closer they are, the more unlikely it is that an SN2 reaction is going to occur. So for instance, if I have a T-butyl or a T-butanol or whatever, two of them on this carbon, it's going to be very unlikely that I actually do a reaction because those groups are so huge and so electronegative that they can block me and that they can repel whatever I'm trying to do. So answer choice E is correct because um, this has a lot of big groups closer to the alpha carbon. So answer choice E would be pretty good. So which one is not a nucleophile? Well A has to be a nucleophile because a nucleophile has lone pairs of electrons. Right? And so a nucleophile actually wants to give up electrons. For water, The height, the sorry, not the hydrogen, but rather the oxygen has a lot of lone pairs, and so it can actually donate some lone pairs, and it can act as a nucleophile. Now, for CH3O, it has a negative, and typically molecules that have negative uh, charges tend to be nucleophiles. They have an excess amount of electrons, and an excess amount of electrons makes you negative. So that's why we're negative. If we have an excess amount of electrons, we can donate those electrons. And when we want to donate electrons, we're being called nucleophiles. So B is not correct because it is a nucleophile. But what about NH3? NH3, you have three hydrogens. And let's see, two, four, six, that means I want eight, seven, eight. And so nitrogen has some lone pairs, right? And everything is balanced. And since nitrogen has this lone pair, it can donate those lone pairs. It doesn't want to, but it can, right? And if it could donate the, that lone pair, it's acting as a nucleophile. So answer choice C is not correct either. What about D? No, oh, an E is incorrect because obviously, um, well, not, not yet. We don't know yet. What about D? Well, right there, it's saying that this nitrogen has four bonds. Do you see any lone pairs on this nitrogen? 
you don't see any lone pairs. And so if you don't have any lone pairs, well, you're not going to be a nucleophile. You're going to actually be an electrophile, right? And so you actually want to give up these electrons. And so if I shoot this off, then nitrogen is going to be what? It's going to be more negative. So, I mean, it's hard to explain, kind of. But a simpler way to explain it, and I apologize, is that, well, if you're positive, if you have a, a molecule that has a positive charge, most likely it's going to be an electrophile, right? So it's going to want to accept some electrons to be neutral. So if we accept some electrons, we're going to decrease our positivity and go to a neutral one. If nitrogen accepted some electrons, so it had to shoot something out, then it's going to be more negative and we want to go to this case. We want to have some lone pairs. right? So that's kind of like the scientific way, but another way to say it for trends is if you have a molecule that has a plus charge, you're going to be electrophilic. If you have a molecule with a negative charge, you're going to be nucleophilic. And sometimes if you don't have any charges at all, you're going to have to draw each one out, such as A for water. You have to draw that one out and realize that oxygen has a lone pair, two lone pairs actually. And since D has a plus charge, it's going to be what? It's actually going to be an electrophile, not a nucleophile. So it's going to be answer choice D. Now we have to rank the following in terms of nucleophilic strength. And so if I want a nucleophil nucleophilic strength ranking, well, I know that my negatives are going to be number one, or, or what? one of these has to be number one, okay? But what really separates the problem is that this positive charge right here, well, anything with a positive charge is going to be acting as an electrophile, and that's not good. That's going to be like the worst case, right? So anything with a plus charge is a really bad nucleophile. So five has a plus charge, and that means it has to be dead last. Right? It's not a good nucleophile. It's actually a really great electrophile. Okay? And so since, since uh, 5 is the worst, it should be last. Only A and C have 5 last. And so D and E are incorrect. Same with thing with B. Now we're saying that, a, that number 1 is going to be greater than number 4. And that makes sense. It makes sense because you have a lot of more electronegative groups right there. So carbon and hydrogens, yeah, they're not that electro electronegative, but if you have a lot of them, it could tip the, the scales in your favor. So I'd rather have a carbon and three hydrogens than one hydrogen, right? So which one's going to be, be more electronegative? Well, clearly it's going to be the one that has a lot of groups that are electronegative, right? So we have four other things attached to the sulfur that are electronegative compared to just one thing that is barely negative at all. Right, and so one is going to be more electronegative than four. Okay, well, hey, over here we have C, and that makes sense. So that's going to be a check mark on C. The reason why A is incorrect is because you're saying one is more electronegative. That's true, but you're saying that number two is going to be more electronegative than four. And does that make sense? Can a neutral atom or can a neutral molecule be more electronegative or be more nucleophilic? than a negative molecule? No, no. So <laughs> you should, if you're looking just at A or C, it should be 1, 4 because those are negative to start with. And then it should be like uh, 2 and 3. So yeah, 2 and 3. The reason why 2 is more electronegative than 3 is because you have more groups attached to this sulfur. right? So we have four things attached to that sulfur compared to just two things, plus the hydrogen right there. But again, the more things attached to you, the more nucleophilic you'll be. And uh, molecules that have a negative charge, they tend to be more nucleophilic. This one is going to be the worst nucleophile because it's an electrophile. It's an electrophile. It's going to have a positive charge, so it should be last. Uh, number one is going to be greater than number four because it has more uh, electronegative groups. Number two is going to be greater than number three because it has more electronegative groups again. Okay, so now we have to move on and go to the weakest nucleophile in, the, in a polar protic solvent. Protic solvent. Right, so what does it mean by protic? Well, protic just means that you're, you have a hydrogen attached to 
your solvent, okay? So it just means that there's a hydrogen right there. And here's a chart that you should know that you have fluorine, you have chlorine, bromine, and iodine, or iodine. Now we're gonna deal, deal with, um, with these protic ones right there, and over here we're gonna be dealing with aprotic. Okay, so the strength or reactivity Okay, so when I say strength, I'm talking about reactivity. I don't know why I didn't write reactivity, but it's there. I'm too lazy to erase it. So we're just gonna keep it, we're gonna roll. So what am I saying? I'm saying that with protic, you're gonna have a very strong nucleophile if it's iodine, if it's protic. And if it's aprotic, you're gonna have a very strong nucleophile that's fluorine. And since it's protic over here in this question, and we want the weakest one, well, I'm gonna pick answer choice D for F. Now here's my logic, here's why. Well, if you have protic, then you're gonna have hydrogen attached to this fluorine, okay? Now this, that's F. And so this fluorine is very electronegative. It means it really loves electrons, okay? Well, if I try to break this bond, it's not gonna wanna break. It's not gonna be very reactive because fluorine is trying to hold on to this hydrogen for its dear life. If you take that hydrogen away, it's gonna throw a temper tantrum and it's super mad and it's super just upset. It's like a toddler, okay? And so if you're trying to take candy away from a toddler, it's gonna be very mad and it's gonna be very feisty. So whenever you have a solvent that has hydrogen, you can act as candy. Fluorine is not gonna give up that candy very well. Okay, if it does give up that candy, it's not going to be a very good nucleophile, okay? Iodine, however, is a bit bigger um, physically than fluorine, so he's a bit more mature. He's going to give up that candy, that candy because, you know, he understands sharing is caring, obviously. But fluorine is so small and so little that he doesn't understand the concept of sharing. And so for a protic, for a candy solvent, it's not going to want to give up that hydrogen, okay? So the strength would actually increase, or the reactivity should increase for iodine. The reason why is because iodine gives up its candy, its hydrogen, very easily, and that gives um, that action of sharing is actually the process of reactions. Because iodine can give, up, can give up that hydrogen so easily, it can do reactions very easily. However, fluorine is not going to want to do reactions because he wants to hold on to his hydrogens. Now, moving on to an aprotic solution, aprotic means that you already took some candy away. So, does iodine want that candy back? Well, he's not a, he, he's not very, he doesn't have a sugar tooth, and so iodine is not upset that you took his candy. If you give it to him, that's cool. If you keep it, that's all right. He's very chill, right? But fluorine is addicted to candy, so he should be in a rehab center for candy addicts or for sugar addicts because fluorine really loves hydrogens. It's very electronegative, and so it wants to keep those hydrogens in the first place. If you take it away, it's going to do whatever it wants, whatever it's possible to get that hydrogen back. And so fluorine is going to push and shove the other molecules and atoms to get that hydrogen. It's going to be very reactive because it wants to get that electron or hydrogen back. Iodine is very chill. He's not going to push anyone, anybody. He's going to say, excuse me. He's going to say, sorry. You know, it'd be cool if you give it back. And, and you know, I, I understand if you don't, you know, it's not like I'm going to cry, says iodine, right? And so fluorine, the reason why it's very reactive when it's aprotic, when it doesn't have candy, is because it really wants that hydrogen. And that's because fluorine is very electronegative. So it wouldn't give it up in the first place, right? And so that's why it's going to be very weak in a protic solution, but very strong in an aprotic solution, okay? So hopefully that clears it up for you. Hopefully you understand um, this question, right? So you think of candy and toddlers <laughs> when you think of protic solutions or solvents, okay? Moving on, we have an SN2 reaction, which SN2 reaction is most likely to occur rapidly in a mixture of water and ethanol. Okay, so water and ethanol. Okay, well, first of all, if you, some, if you want something that's rapid, and we're working with what? 
we're working with water. And hey, does water have protons? Does water have hydrogens? Yeah, it does, okay, but what about ethanol? Well, ethanol is just an ethane mixed with a hydroxide, and hydroxide has a hydrogen. And so are we working with an aprotic solution or a protic solution? We're working with a protic solution. Okay, so protic solution means that we're going to favor iodine or bromine. Fluorine is going to be very slow, okay? Because again, it's like you're trying to take away this candy from a toddler. You're trying to take away hydrogen from a bromine, okay? So that's not good. So for sure, fluorine is bad. So C and E are incorrect. But what about chlorine and bromine? Well, in this chart, it says that bromine is going to give up its hydrogen more easily than chlorine. And so chlorine is not going to be it either. Right? And so the only thing that would actually work would be iodine and bromine. Right? And if you can't see that, well, iodine is going to be very fast either way. And so you can eliminate answer choice D and E because they're working with bromine. And I'd rather work with iodine because he's going to be more reactive. Right? He's going to want to do some reactions. He's very malleable. And then to separate it, fluorine is going to be very slow. He doesn't want to give up his hydrogen. Chlorine is okay giving it up but it's not going to be favored. And then bromine is just going to give it up more easily than chlorine. And so again, it ties into this protic solution, a protic solution. Okay. So the answer choice would be a very, very cool. Actually, it's a happy face. Okay. So now we have to do an S and two reaction and we have to find out which one is going to be uh, most rapid, which one is the quickest one. Okay. Well, if it's an S and two reaction, I know that I have to be uh, I have to have a negative nucleophile. Okay, well, over here, um, this one right here is going to be neutral because water is typically neutral. And this is going to be the substrate. Okay, so some water is going to be reacting with this substrate. That's a nucleophile. This is our substrate. We're focusing on the nucleophile. In this case, water is a nucleophile, but it's going to be very weak because it's, it's neutral. And so that would actually be favored via an SN1 reaction. Uh, same thing over here. This is going to be the substrate, and that's a nucleophile. Well, do you see any metals? No. So typically, this is going to be um, neutral. So that's going to be an SN1, or it could be E1. But anyways, so now you're dealing with A, B, and E, right? A, B, and E. So which one is going to be the best one? Okay. Well, this guy right here, he's actually a really great leaving group. And leaving groups... Well, they tend to be more stable. And the reason why this one is a great leaving group is because it's very stable. And the reason why it's very stable is because it has what? It has resonance, okay? So because this has resonance, it's going to be a very good leaving group. And you cannot use leaving groups as reactants. So this would actually be a really good reactant, okay? But that would be an SM1 reactant, by the way, because it's not negative. You know, if you had a metal, like NaO, that would be SN2 for sure. But it, it's kind of flip-flopped, basically. But because this one is a good leaving group, and it's at, treated as a reactant, it's not going to be very favorable, okay? You're not going to take something weak and make it something strong. You're going to take something strong and then make it weak, okay? Make it more stable. So answer choice B is incorrect. Now it's either between A or E. Well, I'd rather pick what? I'd rather pick E. Why? Well, E, it follows the same trend. And so I'd rather go, let's say you have oxygen and sulfur. Well, it's the same thing as saying like fluorine and iodine. And so which one would I rather pick? Right? Well, I'd rather pick what? For a protic reaction, but notice that we have SH and OH, I'd rather go downwards. And over here, I'm going downwards as well. So you could say that sulfur is going to be more reactive because it could give up that hydrogen more easily than oxygen, right? So it's like the similarities. And so I would say that sulfur is going to be more reactive, more quick. It's going to be quicker to, to do some reactions. Okay, so answer choice E would be correct. Which one of these reactions is going to be very unlikely to occur? Well, it's, it's a no-brainer, really. If you're doing a reaction, am I going to put a halide? And kick out some hydrogen 
No, typically in, in reactions, you're mainly working with halogens. So you're gonna take out a hal sorry, you're gonna take out a halide, right? So A, you could take out an iodine, and that's cool. In C, you could take out a bromine, and that's cool. But in B, you're putting a halide, and you're taking out a hydrogen. Well, that's not very favorable, because you don't you don't do reactions with halides. You do reactions with nucleophiles. Yeah, so nucleophiles are going to be like hydroxide or um, sulfur methyl methyl sulfide or something, right? And answer choice B would not be good because you're not working with halides. If this had, you know, like an NaOH and then an I right there, that would be possible. But we're not going to be doing a reaction with, with iodine as our entering group. Another way you can think of it is that I'd rather have an iodide as a leaving group, not as a reactant. And so I'm not going to have a good leaving group doing a reaction. Very similar to... to um, to B, okay, so iodine is a very good leaving group. I'd rather have it as a product and not as a reactant, okay? And over here, well, you're dealing with what? Well, is this, first of all, I, I typically look at the nucleophile first. Is this negative? Do you see a negative charge? No. Do you see a neutral? Like, do you, if, if there's no negative charge, then most likely it's going to be neutral. And if it's neutral, then it's either SN1 or E1, right? Okay, so it's either SM1 or E1, but you see a double bond placement. It's a double bond placement. Does an SM1 give you that? No. You know what does give you that? E1. And so for sure it's going to be E1. Right. And uh, it's E1 because, first of all, this is neutral. And if it's neutral or a very, very, very weak nucleophile, then it's going to be... SN1 or E1, but notice that we have a double bond placement, and E1 always gives me a double bond placement. So it's going to be B. Okay, over here, over here, um, we have a double bond placement. So is it SN2 or SN1? No, it has to be E1 or E2. Okay, right. So now that we did that, we can eliminate answer choice A and B. But notice that this is a primary carbon. That's a primary carbon right there, okay? And for SN1, you cannot, you cannot do on a primary carbon, okay? So that is not possible. However, E2 can be done on a primary carbon. SN1 and, and um, E2 sorry, so SN1 or E1, my apologies, they cannot be done on a primary carbon, okay? So that's not going to fly, that's not good. But E2, however, can be done on a primary carbon. Since we're working with a primary carbon, we're going to do an E2 reaction, okay? So it's going to be E2 reaction. Now we have a reagent, we have to suggest a reagent for this one. So it's something that has to give me an E1 or E2 reaction because of this double bond placement, okay? And for E1 or E2, you're gonna be working with bases, all right? So I'm gonna give you a hint. You're gonna be working with a big bulky base, okay, a big bulky base. And is sodium hydroxide a big bulky base or is water a big bulky base? No, so A is not right. Same thing with B. Right, so sodium hydride that's very small, it's not that it's either C, D, or E ethanol, right? But, um, let's see, think about it which one is the biggest, bulkiest base, right? Which one is the biggest? Is it T oxide? Is it ethanol? Or is it sodium methoxide? Well, it's actually T oxide, okay. Stebut oxide, it's like this. It would connect to this parent chain or something. But also notice that you typically want a, a tertiary group. So for big bulky bases, you want a tertiary carbon. That's going to be really preferred. 
that's kind of like the really technical reason why it's correct. But if you want kind of like a, a simple reason, it's because uh, to beat oxide is like the biggest, bulkiest base. And so for sure, uh, this would be really possible, right? It'd be good. Um, over here, you have ethanol and sodium methoxide. Well, they're not too big compared to TB oxide. And so if I saw this on an exam, for sure, I would pick the biggest one. And I would pick D for this uh, reaction. So what is the major product of this reaction? Well, I typically look at the nucleophile over here. And I try to realize that I'm trying to rationalize, sorry, that this is actually negative, so it's an anion right here. So this um, metal pulls some negativity or from some positivity from this oxygen, makes it more negative. And so for sure, it's either SN2 or E2. Okay, it's either SN2 or E2. But the real problem is, which one is going to be preferred? Okay, well, over here, they try to do an SN2 reaction. And if you did an SN2 reaction, you have to realize that this right here is a chiral carbon. And so you would actually have to do an inversion for the stereochemistry. And so you should be expecting a wedge, or sorry, a hash um, oxygen, right? So uh, number two is incorrect. Number two is incorrect right there. And over here, somehow you reacted with a methyl group, and that methyl group didn't even have a, a halide on it. And so it shouldn't have, it should have just stayed the same. And so that's going to be incorrect as well. And over here, it's either one or three, which one is going to be preferred, because both of them are correct, right? But which one is going to be more preferred? Well, usually if you're kind of curious, because again, this is a secondary carbon, and so for sure, it's either S2 or E2, which one is going to be preferred? Look at your hydrogens. Over here, you have an implied hydrogen, and same thing over here, so we're just going to say two hydrogens right there. We have one, two, three, there's going to be an implied hydrogen right there. So it's going to be three, four hydrogens. And over here, let's look. We have two hydrogens right there. We have one, two, three, that's one hydrogen. One, two, three, four, none. And then three hydrogens right there. So that's three plus three, that's going to be six hydrogens. And so I'd rather have fewer hydrogens than more, right? So because I have four hydrogens compared to six, I'd rather have four than six is very arcane, is very non-intuitive, but that's the main way you can differentiate between a preferred reaction, okay? So the one that gives you fewer hydrogens is typically the most preferred. So answer choice A would be correct. All right, so I'm just gonna tell you the answer up front. It's gonna be E, none of the answer choices, but I just wanna take this as a learning opportunity, okay? Because for sure, you're kind of having like some troubles with E2 or E1, okay, or E2 or SN2, okay? Well, I, I kind of want to just like clarify some stuff. So this one is going to be either SN2 or E2. Why? Well, because you have a methyl group, or not a methyl group, but you have a metal, and that metal pulls some negativity or from some positivity away from this nitrogen, and it makes it negative. And since you have a negative, you have an anion. And since you have an anion, you're going to be doing either SN2 or E2. And again, this is more clarified because we have a secondary carbon. Okay. So the question is, are we going to do E2 or are we going to do SN SN2? And it's very important for, to, for you to know because if we know which reaction we're going to do, we can just eliminate two of the answer choices. Well, the reason why I'm going to do SN2 and not E2 is because this right here is a super good leaving group, okay? Typically, write this down, typically molecules or substrates that have sulfur make really good leaving groups, okay? And so if I did an E2 reaction, I'm gonna destroy this if I did E2. And I don't wanna destroy something that is a very good leaving group, do I? No, I don't want to destroy something that's a good leaving group. No, I'm going to keep it. I'm actually going to do a substitution. And since sulfur is a really good leaving group, I'm not going to do E2. I'm not going to do any eliminations. And so answer choice A and B are incorrect. So now it's either S and 2, right? It's either 3 and 4. Well, the reason why it's E is because, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. 
first of all, if we were to do a substitution reaction, this would break off. And we form a carbocation, this nitrogen group would go over here and do an inverse. And so this is looking pretty good. What was a wedge becomes a hash. So nitrogen should be a hash. But the reason why it's not correct is because this changed. It went from a hash to a wedge. It should have stayed a hash. We didn't do any reactions with it, so it should have stayed a hash. The reason why this is incorrect is because, well, this whole group right here left, but this guy stayed. And that doesn't happen. Everything has to leave. So 4 is incorrect. Um, but the reason why we would do S and 2 is because this is a really good leaving group. Typically, leaving groups, they have sulfur, and that's really good. Okay, now for 20, we're dealing with um, sodium hydride, which is our nucleophile. And we have THF, which is going to be our solvent, right? And we also have something that's reacting with iodopropane. And one iodopropane means that we have 1, 2, 3, 4... Actually, it's going to be three. So we have iodine. We have one, two, three. Okay. Well, first of all, I had to figure out if this is going to be SN1, SN2, E1, E2. What is it? Well, it's going to be SN1. Why is it SN1? Well, over here, this carbon right here, He's actually attached to another carbon, and so, actually, hmm, it's a bit weird. He's not going to be SN1, I apologize, he's going to be like SN2, right? My bad, sorry. Um, it's easier to say which one is not going to be happening. So E1, E2 is not going to happen. Why is that? Well, you have a base, right? But is the base big and bulky? No, the base is not big and bulky. And so you're not doing C or you're not doing D, right? Because over here, you're saying that this happened via an E2, E1, right? It doesn't matter. You're just saying that you did an elimination reaction, which is not true because elimination favors big and bulky bases, okay? So we do not have a big bulky base. Therefore, that's wrong. So this is wrong right there. Over here, you're saying that this iodine kicked off and somehow went over here, right? And that's not true. You don't do... Well, what I'm trying to say is iodine is a really good leaving group. And so if it's a leaving group, why would it be doing a reaction? I'd rather have it as a product by itself. I don't want it being connected to anything else. And because it's connected to this to cyclohexane, it's going to be very bad. And so that's not going to happen. Over here, this is not possible. Why is it not possible? Well, you only have one, two, three carbons to work with. Over here, you're saying you have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So it has five carbons. Where did the other two carbons come from? Hmm? If we're reacting one iodopropane, we only have three carbons to work with. So where did the other two come from? That's not going to be good. That's bad. Over here, this looks pretty good. It has one, two, three. That looks really good. Okay, it looks pretty good. So, I mean, I would say that this is like an SN1, uh, sorry, an SN2 reaction. So what happened was, what happened was we have iodine, one, two, three, and it's going to react with this cyclohexane with um, this hydroxide right there. Okay, so what happens is that this bond breaks for iodine, right? We form a carbocation over here. We connect. Oh, it is an SM1. Okay, sorry, it's an SM1. So that connects. This hydrogen shoots out, and then this iodine connects with that hydrogen. Okay, <laughs> my apologies. So it's an SM1. How do I know that? Well, I know that because when I connected this iodine or this prop uh, this propane propyl group, I guess, this oxygen for a split moment had three bonds. It had one bond connecting to this guy. It had another bond connecting to this hydrogen, and then it had another bond connecting to this guy. 
to this propane. Now oxygen doesn't want three bonds, it wants two bonds. And so when it's connected to three bonds, it's going to shoot out the hydrogen because uh, hydrogen is very easy to get rid of. It's very acidic with oxygen. And since it's very acidic, it's going to be able to be given up easily. And so we can just give that up. And the process of, of oxygen giving up a hydrogen, sorry, I should re re reward it. Because you had oxygen bound to like three other things, right? And this hydrogen shot off. That's very, very um, SN1-like, okay? Because hydrogen shot off in the end, we're going to have SN1. If you don't know the reaction, you just notice, hey, well, this hydrogen got off somewhere. So I know that at one point, you had a hydrogen right there, but then it shot off, and it gave me this. And so that's an SN1 reaction. That's very favored, okay? Also, you can have said that sodium hydroxide, or not hydroxide, but sodium hydride, it's it's negative, but it's not very negative, okay? It's like hydrogen by itself, it's not very electronegative. So you can just consider it like neutral, okay? That's just sodium hydride. <laughs> and thus saying, you can say, well, if hydrogen is not very electronegative and it's by itself, you can consider it as neutral. And technically, this is like an SN1 reaction. And really, is just kind of like arrow pushing, just reaction paperwork, right? So it's kind of a bad problem, but not really. I just recommend that you go over it. I'm pretty sure I messed up explaining it, but oh well. All right, so now we're dealing with a little bit it's a bit harder than than uh, normal for these problems well first of all notice that over here we're dealing with a secondary carbon right it's the secondary carbon and this one is negative so we have a metal and it's attached to an oxygen so that's really anionic it's gonna be negative so we have the option of doing SN1 or sorry SN2 or E2 so which one is going to be, be preferred? Well, you're going to be doing E2. How do I know that? Well, notice that we're doing this at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. And I know that E2 likes temps that are 50 degrees Celsius and above. Okay, this is very high temperature, so you have some high temp. And so if I have something like, oh, well, we're doing this reaction at 55 degrees, it's an anionic nucleophile, here's our substrate, well, you're going to be thinking, oh, it's E2. Okay, if we're doing E2, then it cannot be 3, okay? It cannot be 3, right? Over here, it cannot be that either. Why is that? Well, you're saying that you have a carbon, a carbon, another carbon, and some carbons. Over here, you have, let's do that in a different color, you have carbon, carbon another carbon and then an oxygen so where did that oxygen or yeah where did that carbon come from did our oxygen somehow transform into a carbon no these are completely different molecules and so two and three are incorrect okay so that means that b is wrong and c is wrong same thing with a that's wrong and obviously e cannot be correct because none you know some of them are wrong so e is wrong and so you get D, 1 and 4, okay? And so it gets really technical, but like whenever you have higher reactions, you can actually bend these uh, these molecules, right? And so it's going to be like a flip-flop effect. You can have one going up, you can have one going down. This would be the, um, the trans, and this would be the cis, right? And um, yeah, so just, just realize that higher temperatures mean that you're going to be doing E2 or E1, okay? So higher temps, they're going to be doing some E2 reactions, some elimination reactions, okay? Now, which one is going to be a major product for which is for the following reactions? Well, you're working with uh, T, T uh, I don't know what that is, some oxygen with potassium, but it's a T-butane with an oxygen and a potassium. 
and over here you have T-butyloxide, hydroxide or something, and these are big bulky bases. And what do you know about big bulky bases? Well, they're going to be elimination favored, okay? And notice that you have an oxygen and a potassium, and a potassium is a metal, so it's going to be what? Is going to be pulling some positivity away from oxygen, so therefore, therefore oxygen, oxygen is going to be more electronegative, and this is going to be anionic. So you have an anionic big bulky base that's going to be E2. All right. So we, we can get rid of 3 because that's a substitution. We could get rid of 2 as well because you have a carbon, carbon, chlorine, a chlorine. And over here you have a carbon, carbon, carbon. So where did that other carbon come from? Yeah, doesn't make any sense. They're completely different molecules, completely different. So two and three are incorrect, but which one am I going to prefer? Am I going to prefer A or am I going to prefer five or D, sorry? Or am I going to prefer more than one of these reactions? If, you, if you're ever at a crossroad, count your hydrogens. So over here we have one, two bonds, so we want two hydrogens. And over here, it's the same thing. So we have two hydrogens. And we have one, two. We have two hydrogens right there. So it's going to be two, four, six hydrogens. And we have here, we have one, two, three. That's one hydrogen. One, two, that's two hydrogens. One, two, three, four. There's nothing right there. And over here, we have three hydrogens. Right? So let's see. Three plus three is three hydrogens. So that's six. Hmm. Well, that doesn't work. So what do I do now? Well, if the hydrogen trick didn't work because they're both equal, then you're gonna just going to have to do some common sense, okay? So my halide was over here, right? And what did I say previously from like a long time ago? Whenever you do an E reaction, an elimination reaction, you want your double bond to be closer to the chloride or to the halide. And so actually, that should be your main priority when you're doing elimination, not the hydrogen. Sorry, sorry for that. And so since we want our double bond to be closest to the halide, the double bond is going to be right here. Okay, it's not going to be here because that's far away from the halide. It's going to be closer to the halide. And so A actually has the closest um, double bond to the halide. So it's going to be A, okay? Not D because D has the double bond further away from the halide. A, it's going to be the correct answer because it has a double bond closer to the halide. Over here, we have a pretty simple question. We have some negative, that's an anion, so it's going to be SN2, or it could be E2. But notice that the temperature that we're doing it is uh, very high, it's like 55 degrees Celsius, and therefore I'm going to be E2 favored, okay? So E2 favored means I'm going to have some double bond placement, so is it one or two? Well, it's not one because there's no double bond. Same thing for two. That's wrong. So it's either... Hey, it's not all of these choices. So just knowing the temperature, you can see that it's going to be C or, or uh, four. Okay. So yeah, it's pretty good, actually. So three and four, uh, these are both okay. Right? Either way, we're attached to this carbon that had the halide, so our double bond should be really close to it, and it's going to be this one. So it's either three or four, it's going to be both. They're both equally good, right? We're, we're very close to the bromide, and we have one, two things attached, three things actually. This one has one and two. So if I had to pick, I would pick three because it has three substituents. It's going to have less hydrogens uh, compared to this four. But anyway, the main takeaway was that because we're doing this at a high temperature, you're going to be elimination favored. So one and two are incorrect. Three and four only have eliminations, so that's going to be correct. And for the last one, you're dealing with what? You're dealing with some ethane, ethyl, ethyl hydroxide, and then sodium ethyl hydroxide. So this is going to be the nucleophile, and this is going to be our solvent. Right, And so this one is actually negative, so that's an anion because metal pulls away some of the positivity from oxygen, it's going to be negative, so it's either going to be SN2 or E2. We'll look over here, 
we have one, two, three. So it's a tertiary carbon, right? Well, first of all, it's a tertiary carbon. And you're dealing with what? An anion. Now, SN2, right? SN2 is very sterically sensitive, so having three groups around you is not good. So automatically, tertiary carbon is going to get rid of SN2. And since we're anionic, we can't be neutral. SN1 only works for neutral. E1 only works for neutral. So we only have E2, or maybe none of these. But then again, we also have uh, big bulky bases. So we we're working with ethane and oxygen. So this is a base, but it's also big and bulky. And so for sure, that looks pretty good for E2. Okay, that looks pretty good for E2. And I would say that it's E2. It's going to be D, right? So I looked at my carbons. Notice I was tertiary. Tertiary means that it's not going to be S and 2 favored. Then I saw, hey, look, this for sure is going to be negative. It's anionic. And it's a big bulky base. So it's going to be E2 favored, right? So it's an E2 favored. It's going to be D. And hey, you now finished the practice exam. And like, I'm super proud of you, for real. Um, you know, it was... It was pretty difficult, but if you do more practice problems, it'll it'll come easily to you, right? Uh, as a recap, E2, E1, they focus on big bulky bases, right? E2 is for anionic, meaning negative nucleophiles. E1 is for neutral nucleophiles. If you have a protic reaction or solvent, well, you, fluorine is going to be very weak, and iodine is going to be very strong. If you have a protic Fluorine is going to be very strong and iodine is going to be very weak. If you increase the temperature for a reaction, for instance, over here, and you have to choose between SN1, E1, or SN2, E2, you're going to, you're going to be focusing on the elimination. Okay. Whenever you have an elimination, you typically want your double bond to be closer to the halide group. Okay. It's closer to the halide group. So that's basically all there is, except you need to remember that for an elimination reaction, you're going to be working with beta hydrogens and beta carbons. Beta just means that um, carbon B is just next to the parent carbon. And so what happens during an elimination reaction, during an elimination reaction, well, it's that, let's say you have this, this beta hydrogen, I don't know what we're reacting with, I'm just doing a kind of like a generic elimination. Um, these guys over here, right? So this one right here would be alpha, so we're not going to be reacting with it. Now immediately next to us is going to be the beta carbon with its beta hydrogens. So it doesn't matter, but it could be the wedge or it could be the hash, depending on your preference. One of these guys is going to pop off, so this electron goes right here, and notice that I put my electron, or my double bond, next to, or very close to the halide group, okay? I did not put it over here, because that's away from the halide group, I'd rather put it closer to the halide group, okay? Very cool. Now after that, this hydrogen goes away. And this bromine also goes away, and they're going to merge together. So we have an HBr, and what you get is this, right? So we have an implied hydrogen. Let's say that it's still that. I mean, it's an, it's an implied hydrogen, so you don't have to draw it out. Technically, it would be incorrect if you draw it out, right? And notice that this bond for bromine disappeared because bromine went away. This hydrogen also went away, so they merged together, make HBr. And that beta hydrogen that left made a double bond with its electrons, okay? So that's an E2 or E1 reaction, right? And um, yeah, that's basically all you have to know. Um, <laughs> It's, um, yeah, just remember big bulky bases for E2, E1. Temperature increases for E2, E1, and uh, you'll be fine. So I hope you have a great day. I hope that you learned something in this session. I hope that you do well on your exam and that you continue to learn. 
and that you don't feel discouraged when you're doing OCHEM, okay? So leave the crying to me. I, I usually cry for this stuff. You don't have to cry. Just um, do your best and just know that I believe in you, okay? Love you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you for watching, okay? Bye.